Yeah. Right, uh, so I think I saw a few of you go to Hans Rosling's talk on Monday. It was pretty good. Uh, for the most part, there was some interesting stuff he had to say, some really interesting statistics and data that he presented. Um, so for those of you that went, I'm sure you got some good insight into what the world around us is. It's actually quite a lot different than you may have anticipated or expected. So if you didn't go, that's uh, no loss. You can still go check out some of his videos online. But again, I thought it was worthwhile for you to go over there just to see some statistics presented outside chemical engineering in something that's very relevant to the rest of our lives. The second point is about the assignments. It's, due, it's available here at the front. Uh, there's also some evaluations. If you did get a chance to put out an evaluation last time, you can either download this form online and you can give it back to me, or there's some spares here at the front. I read through the ones that were submitted last time already. There's some good feedback from there. Uh, some of the stuff I cannot implement, uh, but some of it will be just some changes to see uh, in the next few weeks. So thank you for that feedback. Um, then the last thing is the midterms are being graded. I, I just mentioned Shaila, you should see where he's at. He's doing the last two questions. I'm hoping that he's done by tomorrow so that I can return the in class to you guys tomorrow. Uh, the, the solutions, I will, I will post those today by this evening online. It's just, um, I normally post the solutions a lot quicker, but um, actually this course is also being taught at Western and they went to the same midterm and they were at last night, so I, it's just way for so let's, um, let's take a look at what we left off last time. But maybe before we do that, I'll just point out something here for you. Again, I think part of the worth, uh, part of the value that you get from university education is that it opens up your horizons to potential careers that your parents or any of your colleagues may not actually have realized existed. Uh, it is an interesting one that's been posted. Um, I know the researcher who's happened to post this, but let's take a look at what, what they're asking for. There's, how many of you are in the bio area? Yeah, quite a few of you. You can combine this area with statistics quite easily and in a very powerful manner. They're bioinformatics and genomics. Uh, this researcher in Spain, probably one of the best parts of Europe, is looking for a researcher for master's PhD level, or sorry, postdoc here. So, may not apply if you look at this in a few years' time. Um, but let's take a look at what, what's going on there. Think of all this bio data that we develop when you use when you get a genetic profile. Right? Lots and lots of information. Right? You, I just had my genetic profile done and it's about just under under a megabyte of data. Okay, so there's a lot of information. There's some useful, interesting things in that genetic profile. But when you start to analyze the genetic data from variety of people and combine them into one database and the genes of various um, bacteria that you develop in an automatic or dark laboratory system. So if you go walk up here to the fifth floor, there's a lot of glass walls. You look into that uh, area and you'll see a lot of these automatic sequencing equipment running away upstairs here in the building. Uh, they, they collect a lot of genetic data. What they're looking for is a researcher down here to supply R and MATLAB code, work on those molecular aspects of the genome organization, develop R packages, implement these techniques into predictive models. So you can provide statistics, data analysis, and all your bio information here to develop some really interesting research. Okay, so this is a growing area. Uh, don't discount this as something. And the reason why I'm doing that is 
this is really an important aspect to understand when we start to look at design experiments. So next class Thursday, tomorrow, we start DOEs. DOEs use least squares models exclusively to analyze and understand those models. And those models are by definition involving more than one variable. We have to understand what those models are doing. So this kind of gets us going and thinking along all those lines. And what I want you to do to consider is this example where we had, I said last time, we take a matrix X, total X transpose X. What you'll see is that the diagonal elements will be, for example, X1 transpose X1, X2 transpose X2 in the diagonals. Then the off diagonals will be X1 transpose X2, and this entry will be X2 transpose X1. Now we know from our knowledge of the dark products that these off diagonals are going to be the same. So X1 transpose X2 is the same as X2 transpose X1, because multiplication is cumulative. You don't have to line the order that we do it in. So all diagonals we can calculate, and that matrix will end up being a, a, a real symmetric matrix. And what I wanted to look at is, let's take an example here. The one, this is the example from the handout. You had that x2 was equal to 4, 3, 2, minus 1, minus 2, minus 6. So let's just take that as, as a quick example. And I asked you to calculate one of the entries here, x2 transpose x2. So let's just do that very quickly. x2 transpose x2. Well, very simple, is equal to 4 squared plus 3 squared plus 2 squared plus minus 1 squared plus minus 2 squared plus minus 6 squared. Okay, so you can go calculate that. Um, x transpose x, uh, x2 transpose x2. And that's just some scalar number. And that's the entry that goes into this matrix there in the 2, 2 position. But what I'm more interested in is for you to notice that this is really just a scaled version of the variance of x2. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look at that definition that x2 transpose x2 is nothing more than taking the entries in x2, vector x2, let's call it entry j, and we sum that and square it. So I'm writing it like that. And I can write it like that because x2 bar is 0. We've defined our vectors to be mean center. So we go do a pre-processing step where we mean center our data. So we know that x2 bar is 0. So I can write it like this legitimately. This is quite acceptable. So x2 transpose x actually is a representation of the variance of x2. Well, why is that? Well, variance, recall, for x2 would have been defined as the sum of x2j minus x2 bar squared. And we would have just divided that by n minus 1. So all that's missing here, in fact, is just the n minus 1 division. But that's a scalar. n is constant. We can leave it all and recognize that, in fact, every entry in this matrix would have a divide through by n minus 1 that's missing. Okay? So this matrix, then, represents on the diagonals the variance of x1, the variance of x2. And on the off diagonals, it represents the covariance of x1 with x2. This off diagonal is the covariance of x2 with x1. So the x transpose x matrix has a special interpretation. We call it the variance covariance matrix for that reason. Because the entries in the matrix are simply the scaled versions of the variances and the covariances. So that's, that's an important name that you'll sometimes see me use for this. It's the variance covariance matrix. Variance covariance matrix does. 
And I'm going to ask you to calculate the variance covariance matrix given the following matrix. X is equal to two vectors. The first entry, the first vector here, let's call it x1, is minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1. And the second column represents x2, and that's minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, plus 1. Given that matrix X, I'd like you to calculate for me X transpose X. This should take you less than a minute. Totally uncorrelated. There's no relationship, there's no line forming, no 
positive or negative relationship between those four numbers. There's a correlation of zero between them. Okay? Changes in x1 are independent of changes in x2. That's what the correlation of zero means. Okay? The temperature of this room is uncorrelated to the temperature in JHE. There's no relationship between these two rooms. If that were the case, if the correlation was zero, it would indicate there's no relationship between the two variables. That may be a bad example in this case, actually. But let's take something like the volume of the music in this room is uncorrelated to the volume of the music, say, in another room on the other side of the campus. There's no way that they can be related to each other. So the correlation is zero. The correlation to zero implies no relationship. And that's an important aspect of experiments. We don't want variables to influence other variables, and that zero is going to be an important interpretation. Thank you. Okay, so that understanding is important. Let's move on then and just uh, continue this, this example we looked at last time. <coughs> the main point that I want you to take from this is you can calculate the coefficients from the least squares model by solving this equation over here. And that equation has the solution the coefficients p is equal to x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. We're going to let R do that for us. We're not going to calculate it by hand, except under very particular conditions. What is the x transpose x inverse of this matrix over here? Up to there is what you've seen before. But this line all is defined as 
why did we hold x2 fixed? So in other words, it says x2 constant, so p2 x2 then is a constant by definition. x1 then varies, and p1 represents the amount of change you'll see in y on average for one unit change in x1. And so this an example, we're going to see this example uh, next week when we look at uh, design experiments, and I use this notation which I didn't realize after the fact was a little bit unfortunate, but y is bt times t times bs times s. Whatever it is, bs times s. Well, let's determine what bs means. What does bt mean? T here is the temperature, s is the substrate concentration, it's the bioreactor, and we're measuring yield in milligrams or microgram. So if t there, that minus 0.52, that's going to have units. Why is it going to be the units of microgram, y variable, divided by L, the temperature? So our slopes have units always. The slope of S then represents, is going to have units of micrograms, units of y, divided by the units of S. So 3.2 is going to have units of micrograms per gram per meter. The minus 0.52 is used in micrograms and it says your yield will increase on average by 0.52 units for every one Kelvin increase in temperature, holding substrate fixed. So that's that's a straightforward interpretation. It's going to get a lot more interesting next um, as we start to add integer variables to this. Okay, but before we look at that, I would just want to put this in context for you because you've likely heard this expression before. We will use this word controlling for phrase, controlling form. So let's take a look. Let's say, imagine we go to R and we ask R to calculate this model for us. It calculates the minus 0.52 and 3.2, and R will also calculate confidence intervals. And let's say the confidence interval for Bt, Bt value is minus 0.52, but let's say the confidence interval for Bt is two numbers that span zero. So now we have that the confidence interval span zero, our interpretation then for temperature, Bt, is the effect of temperature controlling for concentration is not significant. So this controlling for concentration, that's that referring to the concentration of S. Bt, the effect of temperature controlling for S, controlling for concentration S is not significant. Let's take a look at the confidence interval for Bs. Well, Bs is 3.2. Let's say that that confidence interval does not span zero. Then you can see this in scientific publications and in literature. It will say the effect of concentration S, control over temperature T, is to increase the yield by 3.2 micrograms for every one gram of yield increase. So controlling for there means that we simply use the other variable in our model. That's a standard phrase that we use and that you see in literature that you control for something. Control for something means that you include whatever that something is in the model as a variable. Okay? And that variable's effect then is taken into account. Now, yes. Okay, can you explain the controlling for quite a game? Okay, so in this expression, when I say the effect of temperature is not significant, Controlling for concentration S means that I'm telling you that temperature does not affect the yield Y. So if that confidence interval didn't, if that confidence interval spans zero, I'm saying that temperature does not affect Y. But I've controlled for S, I've controlled for Y. Where you'll often see this even in general public literature is people will always say, if you, if you plot a, 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 or if you look at data of income versus education, you always see people that come from wealthy families are very educated. You'll also find that if you plot grades of university grades versus income, that there's a positive correlation. So what you'll often see that is people will talk about grades in university controlling for income. And they do that so that the effect of people coming from advantaged backgrounds, in other words, their parents are wealthy, they can afford to send their kids to school, they've controlled for that effect. In other words, they've controlled for income. So they've taken, they've built a model with the grades and family income, both in the model, to predict whatever property is. So it's 
assuming that you've taken into account. Let's take a look here at an uh, example that's engineering related but very relevant. We're going to see integer variables all the time. From this point onwards, integer variables are going to be in every model we consider. And an integer variable is a variable that can take two levels, and we'll see later on multiple levels of attacks. But here we're considering only two for now. Let me consider if I take this reactor, there's a radial inhaler and an axial inhaler that I can choose between. And I can also vary the temperature in the reactor. So I have temperature as one variable and inhaler as a second variable. And I'm trying to predict the yield that I get from that bioreactor. Is my yield higher or lower if I vary the temperature and if I vary the inhaler time? Now the naive approach, and this is probably what you've done and what many other students in ChemEdge will do, is that they'll build one model for the radial inhaler tank and another model for the active inhaler tank. So we'll do a whole bunch of experiments varying the temperature in this tank and relate that to yield. And then we'll build a second, totally separate model for this second tank, vary the temperature in the second tank and try to fit the yield. So you've got temperature being varied, you've got your tank being varied, and you're measuring your output of the yield. That's not a useful use of your data. It's inefficient use of your data. We should combine those two data sets and maximize our degrees of freedom available. Build one model that has two variables in it, the color type and temperature, simultaneously have one model. So how do we do that? Well, it's very easy. Let's go set our model by some intercept. We're going to use the intercept here just for illustration. Plus a variable for temperature, plus another variable, let's call that gamma and D. D represents the effect of the impeller. So now I've got two variables in the model, temperature and impeller. That's my Greek letter model or population model. Let's go to the statistical model that I estimate. We can use a B model to estimate beta 0, estimate B1 from beta 1, estimate G from gamma. And D is equal to a 0 if I use the axial impeller, it's equal to a 1 if I use the radial impeller. So if I go look at my model now, let's first consider that temperature has no effect. Let's just pretend that our temperature has got zero effect on the model. So my model reduces down to B0 plus G times D. So if I took the data from my axial impeller, remember axial impeller was coded with D equals zero. There's a new word we're going to use. We're coding our axial impeller with D equals zero. We're coding our radial impeller with D equals one. Coding simply means I choose to denote by, or I'm choosing to represent. My axial impeller by D zero, my radial impeller is D one. So if I make that substitution now, D is equal to zero, D is equal to one in those two cases, my model simplifies to two very simple equations over there. The first model is y is equal to b0 plus 0. That's interesting. It simply says y is equal to some constant, some intercept. The second model is y is some that same constant plus g. g then is this distance between b0 plus g. So b0 then is all my data. If I just plot my data in numerical order, for the axial inhaler, remember axial inhaler was d equals zero. Those data points would lie over here. So in other words, these are the yields that I get from my bioreactor when I'm using the axial inhaler. So I get these lower values of yield. Then in my reactor where I use the radial inhaler, d is equal to one, and if g is a positive value, these points will lie above the others, indicating that the radial inhaler leads to improved yields. So that G then, all the G represents is the improvement in yield when you go from an axial impeller to a radial impeller. So it's a deviation. It's the improvement relative to a baseline. And that's the key insight of an integer variable. Integer variables are always relative to some baseline. So 
given my baseline is the maximum error when t equals zero, my improvement is going to the radio and then t is equal to So how do you interpret that g value? If g is a certain value, we can improve, interpret that as the difference of the improvements in the world. Now let's bring back the temperature there. I previously omitted it. Let's bring temperature back now. And we throw that back in. The model is still the same. All that, that happens is that those horizontal lines now get a slope. Okay, so all I've done is just tilted those two lines up and they now have a slope. Okay, I'm going to come back to this um, line six here. So a visual way of looking at this is x1 here, that's my temperature variable. T represents whether I've got an axial or radial leak element. And essentially, all I've done is plotted those two lines on a slope, and they're offset. So it's still a plane. The only difference is this time my plane happens to go through points which are separated by a piece of space between 0 for the axial impeller, 1 for the radial impeller. You cannot have a point 0.5 or 0.2 or 0.3. There's no continuity in this axis going back into the page. But the geometry of these squares is identical. It's still a plane in the fits of data points. And the slopes of the plane represents this, this line slope of here represents the effective temperature. This slope over there represents the impeller effect. Because that's the slope going back to the page on the Axis. So this represents the effect of change of the impeller from one type to another type. Everyone clear on that? This is, this is an important topic to understand. What part don't you understand? Like, go like, go one, and let's say I'm going to Okay, you can't have non-integer values on this axis because zero is rated axial and one is radial is the other one. One is axial, the other is radial. You can't have zero or zero or one. We choose to code with the zero or one, yeah. Anything else that's Okay, 
everyone comes cool with that. So now we're going to kick it up a little bit. So go to three integer variables. Okay. If g was equal to minus one. These are two, two, two different slides. Yeah, I'm saying what if we get a case, I'm asking you what if this interpretation of g equals minus 56, and the second example is what if you saw it on this. Yeah. So my point that I want to make is that when you look at this model, there's temperature, that's a continuous variable. It's got a slope of E1. Here's a second variable, D, representing an integer variable, with a slope of G. Your interpretation of these two slope coefficients is identical. The fact that there's an integer variable makes no difference to you. The only time it makes a difference is if you want to visualize what you're dealing with. Now, some of you are very geometric and visually inclined, so if you want to visualize what, that, what your data set looks like, this is the picture you need to have in mind for integer variables. If both the variables are continuous, this is the picture you have in Some points are above the plane, some points are below. If one of your variables is, is integer, those points just simply push to the extremes. variables a little bit more carefully, and this is the way that you do it, shown up here. 
you can set, for example, 0, 0 equals Spain. So D1 equals to 0, D2 equals 0 corresponds to Spain. Change just D1 from 0 to 1 and leave D2 at 0, and that codes for India. And then we can code Vietnam as leave D1 back at 0, but change D2 to 1. And codes for Now, how do you interpret? Let's say you've got a gamma value here. Let's say you estimate gamma 1 or G1. And let's say G1 is equal to 3. So G1 is equal to 3. Tell your neighbor what is the interpretation of that. Put this first coefficient to zero, that to one, and then that to zero. So zero, one, 
zero, one, zero codes for India and then zero, zero, one codes for Vietnam. That might seem intuitive because then that G1 is going to be the effect for Spain, G2 is going to be the effect for India, and G3 is going to be the effect for Vietnam. But what you'll find is if you do that in R or in any software, with X transpose X is perfectly correlated in the count and both that. So you actually cannot calculate that model because you're going to have perfect correlation in the So this is not a sensible choice for the code. You have to resort to this coding, it's a little bit more messy to work with, but it's it's intention. So I put, give, to give you a concrete example, this is one way I've used it was for raw materials, another way I've used it in, when we look at reactors. So we've got reactor A, B, C, and D in the process. And you want to predict which reactor, or it's known that each reactor has a slightly different effect on, on the supply. So you go and add how many variables to the model? You've got reactor A, B, C, and D. How many new variables do you need to go add to the model? Okay. Three. Okay. You always add one fewer variable than you've got levels for an integer variable. So if you've got an integer variable with five levels, you need to go add a D1 and D2. So always take one fewer level and add that many number of integer variables. Here I've got three levels, Spain, and Vietnam, I need to add two integer variables to the model. If you have five levels in your integer variable, you need to go add four new slope coefficients. Okay, so that's that's a uh, integer variables. The next part that I, I'm not going to touch on, it's, um, it really is here just for um, enrichment, is on outliers, discrepancy, leverage, and influence. Um, 600 level students, you must read this part on your own time. It's fully described in the course textbook. The slides give you some visual illustrations on what leverage, outliers, and discrepancy are. Um, I will not cover it here in the class time because it is for enrichment. So 600 level students, last go read that in your time. 400 level students will benefit from reading some of that stuff. Um, but this is the extent of knowledge I need for tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll start designing experiments. I will post the PDF for those course notes.